So please give a warm welcome to Chris Genowine. Uh, come on up. Yes. Yep. Perfect. Thanks, Linda. So first off, I am not going to sell any Oracle software today. <laughs> so um, I'm not on the sales side. I'm internally within IT. A uh, little bit about my background um, with Oracle. I've been with them for about two years. Um, I oversee the service management disciplines within the IT organization. Um, interface across, you know, really the broad range of um, the different business units within Oracle. Um, I've heard a, a lot of consistent themes, um, you know, over the past, you know, clicker's not working. Um, over the past couple of days, um, change has been pretty consistent. And uh, the other night I was having a couple of cocktails and conversations with folks, and we were relating um, really the era that we're in right now is that pivotal um, state that if you go back to the Industrial Revolution when um, combustion engines came in and kind of changed the dynamics of the workforce, we're seeing things like Agile, we're seeing things like DevOps, um, we're seeing things like no-code IT, where our business is getting more and more accustomed to leveraging services like AWS or Oracle or you know any one of the, the major cloud companies that are out there and developing their own solutions. And we have a challenge within IT. That challenge is that you know, we want to enable the business, we want to partner with the business, but in a lot of ways we want to limit you know, what type of development they do on their own, um, which is why I've been so interested in frameworks for the, the past 10 years. Um, looking at how we can further integrate with the business requirements the business needs and empower them when, when and where that makes sense, but secondarily, um, let them leverage IT to help them be more agile, get their products to market quite a bit quicker. Oh, looks like I'll be doing this. So a little bit about myself. Um, about 20 years um, in IT. Um, previous to that, I was with um, retail operations where um, I oversaw the you know, delivery of services and um, came into my previous company with that background, not even on the IT side. Um, I got to play a unique role with them where I could relate the business into IT um, and understand what IT impact had to the overall business. Um, started out with the uh, mainframe engineering group um, about 20 years ago, and then through that time worked all across IT, whether that was distributed systems, whether that was integration, project program management. Um, and for about 10 years of that, I was focused on innovation. Um, I was partnering with companies like IBM and, um, and Sun back at the time and, and others to help co-develop products um, because I was working in a company that really touched the majority of Americans um, with the products and services that they had. Uh, one of the things that we were able to do during that time frame is change the model of the company. We went from a very large grocery company to a technology company, and we invested more in technology um, than we did in, you know, in a lot of the products or services that we supported. And a lot of that was to bring revenue into the company, you know, and grocery margins are exceptionally small. So you have to leverage technology to you know, grow your consumer base, to get them to buy more products, to understand their shopping habits so that you can bring that um, into the stores and, and get them to buy more. Um, as Linda had mentioned, you know, I've gone through two implementations of IT for IT, and both of the use cases around those implementations are dramatically different from one another. Um, so I'll talk about the first one just real briefly. Um, there was something uh, the other day somebody asked that I brought forward into this presentation, um, just to give everybody a, an idea on the, the two different ways that we look at IT for IT. Um, so I'll start this one out with a story. Um, I was sitting at my desk one day, and I get a phone call from the CIO. 
and he said, in 30 minutes, I need you to join me in the CEO's office. Never a good conversation. You know, it, you need to worry about, you know, what is the CEO thinking at that time? <clears throat> what did IT do wrong? So I walked across the street over to the mahogany office and um, sat down at the, the conference table that the CEO had in his office. And he posed a simple question. He said, we're spending too much on IT. What can we do to fix it? And it, it was a unique challenge um, that we had um, you know, lots of ideas that we could have done. At this point, we had already transformed more into a technology model than the grocery model. And I asked him to, to quantify his, his statement a little bit more. He said, well, you know, we spend more on IT in this company than we do in the rest of the business. We spend too much on software. We spend too much on the employee base. They're high cost resources. What can we do to bring some of that back in so that we can reinvest in our business? Um, at the time, he wanted to remodel all of our stores and come out with some new, new concepts within the stores. So I thought about it, and I understood um, the concept of spending too much on tools. Um, part of my responsibility at that time was I had ownership over all of the IT tools. Um, I had responsibility for automation in the environment. And there was a lot of things that we were starting to do, um, but nothing that, that was really bringing benefit or value back into the overall company from a tooling perspective. So I, I suggested, well, you know, we can take a look at the tools, we can see what we can reduce, um, we can definitely automate more in the environment, but I didn't have a solid plan and that's not really what the CEO wanted to hear at the time. Um, so I reached out to a couple of people in the industry um, to get their thoughts and um, there was actually a CTO of HP that said, hey, there's this brand new framework that we're starting to collaborate on and contribute to, um, which was IT for IT. Um, and at that point in time, I said, all right, well, teach me a little bit more about it. And I got connected with some of the people in the room here um, and started talking about what is this framework. I've never understood you know, how an operating framework may apply in this situation, but hey, I'm open for a conversation. So we started down the path, and, and what we realized was that we had an abundance of tools. We surveyed all 1,200 IT employees. We did discovery on their laptops. We looked at things like the CMDB, and we came out with um, 1,300 tools and IT applications that were used within IT. Just a tremendous amount of software. Now, granted, some of those were IDEs that were used by developers and you know, some open source stuff that maybe we didn't have control or were spending money on. But at the end of the day, there was no way that we could be efficient with 1,300 tools. We had 1,500 business applications. You know, this is a company with about 220,000 employees. Yeah, you expect you know, that. And they weren't only a grocery company. They did manufacturing, they did supply chain, they did banking, they did pharmacy. Um, so each line of business had its own unique software and applications. So after going through the initial conversations with some of the folks from HP and people um, that represented the open group, we came up with a plan. We said, we want to reduce or rationalize the tools that we have, and we could use the IT for IT framework to do that. We could map every application or every tool that we had specifically to IT <laughs> against the value streams within IT for IT. We could come up with a plan through that rationalization effort on how to return money back into the company. And we could look for opportunities for automation. It wasn't a, a scenario where we wanted to say, we want to change the way that we operate, apply IT for IT towards our processes. Rather, it was a way that we could bring value back into the company. 
So as a result, in some of the statistics that you can see up here, is we were able to reduce tools by 40%. We were able to reduce the business software by 30%. We were able to um, find gaps in our processes, kind of an outcome of going through the, the whole exercise, and bridge some of our processes together. We thought we had a very solid um, ITSM and ITOM framework, um, but we found gaps, and we were able to improve on that. We were able to get 100% of our processes aligned back to IT for IT, something that we struggled with as a company for years um, to really understand how does this one particular tool relate to change management? How does change management relate back, to, back into incident management? We were strong in ITIL, but understanding why something needed to be integrated was not something that we were exceptionally strong with. At the end of the day, and to date, they've saved close to $70 million, and that figures from about a year ago, last I checked. Um, I knew that they were doing another um, effort around this, which would have ended up saving them um, probably another 20 to $30 million after I left the company. So this slide gives you an example around how we relate it, and I apologize, the graphic came out a little small. But what we did was we looked at every tool specific to the value streams and then the components within the value streams. We were very heavy in a couple sections, things like service monitoring, which is the one at the bottom. We ended up having 285, give or take, tools just in service monitoring. So this is a situation where we went out, we bought the best of breed products, and then realized, eh, you probably don't need duplicate tools that are out there. Can we change our business process? Can we change certain things so that we don't need 285 service monitoring tools? Um, things like um, uh, change management, we had one tool in place. That's great. You know, those are all things that you want to investigate. So we overlaid that on top of IT for IT, and then what we did was started mapping it. And we can see how everything related in terms of our tooling back into that. And then we found areas of deficiency. Maybe we had to go invest in a tool, or in some cases, we could look at this to say, where could it be automated? When you break it down at the tool level, we can see each color represents a different tool. And this is showing detect a correct here because that was probably our biggest problem area. We invested so much in monitoring, so much in problem resolution, so much in automation, but we never offset tools as we brought new ones on. Um, so the bottom one, service monitoring there, that was a, um, a result of probably 10 different managers coming into the department, all having their own budget, buying tools that they liked, but never retiring it. All right, so um, this last slide here uh, on our first implementation shows the end result. You know, we built an ITOM model that was all based on IT for IT, all based on our tool cleanup, and where we could see the integration not only of certain pieces of IT, whether that was service management, whether that was automation, whether that was CMDB or business management, um, all of it became interrelated. This was our foundation for understanding the roadmap for automation going forward. By the time that this was implemented, um, about 60% of IT processes were automated and available through a service catalog. So any business user, if they wanted it, a compute environment, click of a button. They could get it, it would all be you know, charged back um, to their um, cost center. So let's look at Oracle. Um, who here has not heard of Oracle? Okay. Um, Oracle is a, a pretty large company. Um, we have about 152,000 employees and contractors and we touch about 500,000 customers worldwide. Um, internally, um, and I have some statistics up there, even though we have a core IT 
organization of about 7,500 people. Being a technology company, a big chunk of our business um, is around technology. So 40,000 developers. We have 100 and, uh, you know, 110,000, um, I'm sorry, 160,000 people that are dedicated to supporting our customers. Um, yeah, our model here is, is really around developing those products, getting those products to market, and then supporting our customers as well. Um, we also do a large amount with the education system. So we have three and a half million students worldwide that we sponsor, um, either through technology programs in a school or through um, scholarships and education. Um, on our corporate campus, we're in the process of launching a brand new high school um, where it's completely technology focused, trying to teach the youth you know, things like programming and kind of these modern skills that are coming up. Um, <clears throat> if you look at where we play in the market, um, it's just about everywhere. Um, and that presents a unique challenge for us because we're in the process right now of moving from a software company to a cloud company. Now, we will have all of our software in the cloud, um, but we realize the industry is changing. All of our customers are changing. They're going to cloud, they're going to agile, um, and they don't necessarily want to manage their own infrastructure anymore. We're seeing a decline of overall data centers across the world. We're seeing you know, more investment in cloud. 10 years ago, when I first heard cloud, I thought, oh great, this is the, the next big buzzword, um, but it's come to reality. And in truth, cloud, you know, even though it is a marketing term, you know, it's been around since the 60s with mainframe MVS and some other things, but it's getting widely adopted right now because it's cost effective, it's fast, and it enables you to get your products out to market much quicker. So if I look at Oracle, you know, 10 years ago and you know, before I joined, 15 years ago, um, they were in this mode of doing massive acquisition. And during that time, well, and we're still doing acquisitions today, but back then it was really significant acquisitions so that they could grow their portfolio of software. Um, we built ourselves into a corner that we would go out and buy all of these companies but each company had a unique ERP system. Each company had a unique email system. Each company had um, kind of their own ways of doing things. And that ended up resulting in, um, you know, kind of a, an epiphany, if you will, that internally in IT, we had to get our arms around this. We would not be able to survive as a company if we had to manage 24, 30 ERP systems, so on and so forth. Not only from an infrastructure perspective was it um, very costly, but from a um, supportability perspective it was as well. So then ITIL came along and we said, ITIL, great. We're gonna implement ITIL, we're going to standardize things, we're gonna build out these robust service catalogs, we're gonna give our customers the best in class solutions. The problem there was we had no conversations with the business. We had no idea around what they needed. So this was IT developing all of these solutions. We consolidated 30 ERP solutions, but we never went back to the business to say, how does this impact your business process as we're doing consolidation? If we standardize, what does that mean to you? So, we had another challenge. It wasn't that we had 30 ERP systems out there. We had one at this point, or you know, multiple email systems. But now we became almost inflexible because we've standardized. Even though the intention was to give our customers more freedom, um, we thought that we could react quicker. The reality was is that we slowed ourselves down. And when we slowed ourselves down, we ended up frustrating ourselves or alienating ourselves from our business. They again thought IT is just another expensive cost center within our company. Maybe we need to go out and look at other solutions. 
So during that time frame, as we were consolidating, the business started creating their own IT organizations. And it wasn't pseudo IT, they were full IT organizations. So we you know, ended up having these massive IT organizations that then competed with one another. But the business did it out of necessity. They did it because they had to get their products developed, get their products tested, get their products out to market. Because in a software company or a technology company like Oracle is, if you're not the first to market, you're not being competitive and you're losing market share. So we had to rethink around how IT was doing IT. We started seeing explosive changes in the industry. We talked about cloud a little bit. Cloud was one of those big things. We saw big data. You know, there was kind of this trend about six, seven years ago where all of these things were hitting us at once. And a lot of our customers and what we heard from our customers were they were considering these ideas, but they didn't know how to implement them. So they were going to wait to see what happened in the market. Then you had growth of AWS. You had growth of Azure. You had growth of ServiceNow and some of these other really big companies that just kind of get a hold of our customers, not our customers being Oracle, but all of ours. And we would all start um, evaluating, you know, what are they doing? Why, why are so many people going to AWS? We saw the adoption of cloud. We saw agile come to market, DevOps come to market. And because of that, a lot of the technology companies had to start shifting how they supported, how they did IT internally, how we operated as a business. We saw things such as continuous integration. So our ability to put code in, um, manage and leverage other people's developed code, continuous delivery come out of the market. Um, we saw an explosion of open source tools that came with us. And companies were getting more and more comfortable around either deploying to an internal cloud, maybe it was a VMware stack, or starting to reach out to public cloud offerings. There was a, still, you know, if I look at five years ago, six years ago, there were still some concerns about clouds. What's the security of a cloud? How can I make sure that my data is protected? How can I make sure that the cloud itself is not going to go down? I mean, we've seen AWS go down several times over the past few years. We've seen Azure go down. You know, that, that's common things that, that you hear from folks out there. But things are getting more stable. They're learning about HA designs. They're lear learning about elasticity. And in the most recent couple of years, there's the explosion of containers. So things like Docker, using Kubernetes, using Swarm, to be able to have a serverless or a stateless compute environment. These are the types of things that are driving the industry right now. And as I started out saying, you know, we're at that pivotal point. Um, a place in our lives that, where we'll never see technology switch like it is right now, going from traditional models to these agile models, looking at how can I deliver code in minutes versus weeks, months, or in sometimes years. Um, we've looked at how do we get away from monolithic type projects. <clears throat> Cloud is, is changing a lot of things. Um, one of our CEOs spoke recently around his thoughts on cloud, you know, and some of his predictions. Um, five years ago, people were using cloud only for dev and test. Now people are very comfortable with putting production into cloud or using cloud in a hybrid type of architecture where they're bursting out to it. Um, he predicts within the next few years, 100% of dev tests will be in cloud. There's gonna be no need to run dev and test on your own data centers. You'll spin it up when you need it, spin it down. If you look at things like containers, or even cloud pa um, PaaS or SaaS environments, you know, where you're paying based on utilization, you know, 
why have a server running full time to support that? Just spin it up as you need to. Oracle's big shift right now is to get um, our customers out of the on-prem business. And we realize there's a, a lot of our customers that are running um, very expensive software in their data centers on top of very expensive hardware in some cases if you're you know, running Exadata or Exalogic or you know, one of those big iron boxes um, to where we're incentivizing our customers. We're giving them um, you know, basically a way to get out of the data center business. Cheaper licensing in our data center. Um, we'll even do management of your Oracle database environments. Um, two weeks ago at Open World, uh, Larry Ellison announced um, a new database platform that's leveraging AI that tunes itself, it upgrades itself, it patches itself, all without a DBA involved. Um, we see these times changing. Um, there's a lot of investment you know, across all cloud companies on those capabilities, and we're starting to see um, all of these companies compete with one another, trying to get these new capabilities out to market. So if we don't respond, you know, and response is either to what our business demands, you know, everybody has an iPhone now, they can get an iPhone application in seconds, um, there's no instruction manual associated with it, our business wants solutions to be intuitive, but they want it in minutes. You know, if we can't do that, IT's gonna die. If, if um, we're not able to recover from a incident in the environment, they're gonna look at maybe a solution provider to help out with IT. Um, if we're not able to provide the capabilities that they need for the business to be successful, because it's not only IT that's going at a much faster rate today, the business is going five times faster. And if we're not able to adapt to that, they're gonna look for other avenues. And we'll see the emergence of more shadow IT, you know, especially leveraging those no code type of solutions. So as I said in the, in the beginning, we've heard a lot of things about change. Um, just a couple of quotes that I really like here. Um, change is hard because people overestimate the value of what they have and, and underestimate the value of what they may gain by giving that up. Um, we've talked a, a lot about how IT is changing and, and people get scared when you talk about IT. When you tell a network engineer, guess what? In two years, you will no longer be a network engineer. You're either going to be writing the automation or you're going to help with the DevOps pipeline yeah, you know, they get scared. They don't understand, you know, those traditional roles are changing into infrastructure developers more than anything else. We see software-defined data centers, so your network is now considered code. Your application is considered code. Your operating system is considered code. Every discipline that we know as IT, especially in the infrastructure areas, has now been reclassed. And you manage an operating system just like you manage an ERP application. You know, it's all code and it's all bundled together. So I'll get into a little bit more of the details around our transformation. Um, so about a year ago, another phone call from the CIO and he had said, you know, I don't think that we're, we're supporting our business well enough, that we're not moving fast enough we need to look at other ways to operate as an IT organization. And one of the reasons I joined Oracle a couple of years ago um, was that I could help do things like this, that I could help influence change. Um, the CIO at the time was very interested in my background with IT for IT. He was very interested in what I had done with automation and tools rationalization, some of those more recent activities. Um, and he knew that I was you know, familiar with a lot of the concepts up here. And we had a conversation, should we follow ITIL anymore? Is ITIL still relevant in a modern IT organization? Or should we be looking at things like Agile? Should we still do waterfall in some cases? You know, and the concept of DevOps. So I started taking a look at 
the overall process model within IT. Um, and within Oracle, and you know, this may or may not shock some of you, but we were very, very dysfunctionally or dysfunctional inside of IT. We did change management, we did incident management, event management, kind of the core things. But out of the 26 ITIL processes, you know, we had about 18 that I would say we had defined and were actively executing. But the problem was is that we only had one or two processes that were actually talking to a central repository, and it wasn't even a CMDB, it was an asset management solution. And across processes, nothing was talking with one another. So the first thing that we wanted to do through this transformation was change the way that we physically operated as an IT organization. We knew that we had to integrate our processes. We knew that we had to deploy a CMDB. We knew that we had to make our processes as agile-like as possible. We looked at methodologies like agile, like lean. Um, we looked at IT for IT. And we said, you know, what's going to be the right thing for Oracle? We know that you know, we have to start out with a basic process model and make it a little bit more mature. And by the time that we're done, just like the other drawing I was showing up there, we have to have everything talking to one another. You have to have a relationship model on all of your processes, which then spawn into your procedures, which then spawn into your organizational structure. So being a big fan of IT for IT as I am, I brought this forward. Um, and I had a small group that was working on the process definition. I said, this is what I want to do. I want to take the overall reference architecture um, for IT for IT and lay all of our processes on top of it. So as we start looking at how those processes are interconnected, um, we want to make sure that we have these types of relationships built out. I then said, you know, process is a great start, but we have to have a vision around what is that business model going to look like, and business model being the IT business model. So we leaned on a company called CEB where they had a um, new model that they were pitching out there called the digital enterprise model. And it, it pulls in a lot of things from Agile, but it also um, looks at you know, some of those traditional approaches as well. Um, but it's really built around efficiency within your IT organization. And then per that conversation with the CIO, we knew that we wanted to become more Agile-like. And we looked at a handful of of um, agile methodologies out there. And we said, well, scaled agile looks right. It allows you to operate in a multimodal fashion. You can still have traditional infrastructure and DevOps team and still manage the overall lifecycle and delivery of those capabilities. So the first thing that we did when we looked at IT for IT was the value streams. We said, here are the major processes that we want to deal with, and how do we align that to the overall value streams? We started with a small set of processes. We looked at seven initially, configuration management, test management, release management, change management. And what we did during this process was we scrapped all the flow charts and all the process definitions that we've had for years, and we wrote, rewrote them from scratch. We said, in order to survive the future, what do these processes have to look like? We then moved into the second wave of processes, filling it out a little bit more in detail. Uh, this was going to give us the secondary ones that built on top of the primary processes, and again, looking at having all of those interconnected, having them agile-like, having them lean. Um, and as every process was developed, the sub points within those processes, every single one was aligned to a tool or automation. So 
So if we take a look at how these all overlay, if we look at strategy to portfolio, for example, um, we were able to align that specifically to the initial engagement piece with Agile. We were able to say, this is the roles, or these are the roles, and here's how they'll operate based on the overall process definition. As with any activity that we wanted to do with this, we never designed or selected tooling until after the process and the overall operating model was completed. Too many times in IT we will buy a tool and then try to fit your business model around it. Um, this time around we actually wanted to do pure process definition and have it guide the organization. I'm running a little short on time so I'm going to skip through these a little bit. Um, here's another one where we're looking at requirements to deploy, um, where Agile has a pretty robust model there, and then we can overlay the tools on top of that as well. Um, as each one of these becomes a little bit more detailed, you see tools that are in there. And one of the things that you'll see, surprisingly, is that most of these are not Oracle tools. We went out to open source tooling for the, mo for the majority of this. We wanted our tooling model to be just as modular and flexible as our process model itself. Here's another one looking at request to fulfill. And the last one is detect to correct. Um, one of the big things here that we implemented was this loopback model. We've heard that a couple of times this morning. Um, one of the things that we've never done well at internally in IT is getting issues, getting incidents, getting inefficiencies reported back up. Um, so as part of this, we've abandoned the problem management process completely. And we've only implemented the defect management process. Um, so that any time an incident happens or an event that needs to be corrected, then it goes back into the overall backlog, gets addressed. So we only expect it to happen once. This slide here shows um, how we've then taken IT for IT and aligned that to the overall organizational model. Uh, we've deployed in a matrixed format. So we have some line management which is going horizontal, things such as automation, things like risk, things like your overall platform, Form, um, support. Um, those are all horizontal in nature. And then just like the last presentation we saw that we have um, specific portfolios or value streams that are aligned to this. Um, those are either technology capabilities or specific lines of business. And my last slide here, looking at the result. So as we have it implemented now, um, we are about a year into a three year journey. We have um, uh, our first part of IT up and live using IT for IT, using Scaled Agile, um, which incorporates uh, about um, 600 configuration items, uh, about six services, and um, here we can see um, 64 Agile developed applications. It also incorporates the traditional, non-Agile, traditional data center applications in there as well. Um, things that we've incorporated into this, things like CAB, change approved bo uh, boards, has been completely eliminated. So as we um, you know, made the process more Agile-like, more lean, we track all changes through automation through master data management, those types of things. So we still have the record, but nobody has to go in and file a change. Um, we've seen efficiency gains. So change management went from a 10-day process basically down to 24 hours. Server deployments or compute environment deployments have improved by 500% just by transforming the way that we work and aligning that to IT for IT. And Turn it back to you. I see you have a quote, just like our previous speaker. Yes. <laughs> Did you want to put some context to that? On this one? 
Um, I think, you know, as we were talking about change, um, there's always that point of uncertainty. So um, this, this quote in general is really about accepting it and um, understand that if you're not in for that long haul, if you're not willing to weather the storm, you know, then you could uh, have consequences. Absolutely. Yep. Does anyone else feel like one of those last slides was hitting the holy grail? It was pretty amazing um, to just think eight years ago that that when we were investing so heavily in in, in the advise, change advisory boards and mm -hmm. locking them in, just the things on your slide are, are things that I, I hear customers all the time trying to achieve. Why don't we sit down sure. and talk about it a little more because you have a very vast number of questions that people want to hear about from you. Uh, let's start right right from the beginning. Um, I knew this would come up. People were pretty impressed by the numbers you showed in your first use case with your former employer. And so the question here was, can you give us a feel for what time frame they realized that those big numbers in savings? I think you said 60, 70 million to date? As about 70 million to date. Um, and the overall execution of that effort uh, started, well, we did planning for nine months. Um, and so the actual execution, the tools rationalization, started about three and a half, four years ago. So I gather that he got his, uh, his story models just thanks to that. Oh, yeah. That's excellent. Okay. Yep. Um, let's see. Another really good one is... Um, in the in the big uh, on the, again on that first use case, um, people are asking questions about the actual methodology. So I think we could maybe take this at the high level because am I correct? You're available on the lunch hour and on the coffee break today for people to find yeah. you for details. Yeah, okay. So here's one that you could dive very deep on, but you can stay at the high level. What methodology did your organization use to find out the process gaps with respect to IT for IT? So back when you showed your map ap application rationalization exercise. Um, so there were a couple of methodologies that we actually leaned on. Um, so some of those were introduced through enterprise architecture. Um, we did a um, pretty close engagement with them um, through that journey. Um, so we had to understand capabilities, we had to understand business alignment. Um, and then in terms of the overall discovery approach, um, we followed very much an, an Agile-like type process. Um, everything was done in very small iterations. Um, it was all done through you know, kind of intimate type sessions to really understand what was out there. Um, we didn't use a formal industry methodology um, until we actually aligned to IT for IT. And then our business partner at the time helped us through that process. Yeah, and then I think we had a question here related to that as well, which is that your, your uh, horizontal bar chart over there was showing tremendous um, duplication of apps that you called out in your session, but it also looked like it showed some gaps um, mm -hmm. So people were asking, um, was there something that came out that was um, actually missing or? Uh, no, great question. So in some cases, we um, offset tools with more of a enterprise platform. Um, and in other cases, we offset them with um, automation. Um, there were gaps as we found throughout that process. And that was actually a deciding factor to say, why don't we go from, you know, 1,300 tools down to basically 140 service platforms. So we went with some bigger platforms in some cases, um, but we tried to automate as much as we could, you know, if that was possible. Yeah, excellent. So then moving on to the Oracle case study, uh, the question is, do you use IT for IT to support your current offerings on the cloud arm of your business or in your internal IT operating model? Um, so a little bit of both. Um, right now, the, the primary focus has been around internal IT. Um, and we're in year one of a three-year journey. Um, we've introduced our cloud business to IT for IT. Um, and they're using a, a couple of different methodologies today. Um, but the intention is you know, over the, the course of the next three years that they'll be more heavily consuming IT for IT, 
We're also introducing TOGAF as part of this whole journey. Um, it's my first implementation of TOGAF, so it's going to be interesting going through that. Um, but I'd like to apply that to them as well. Maybe you can come back and talk to us about that next year with Maybe some, another opportunity. some outcomes. Excellent. Yep. Um, let's see. Do you, um, how did you realize the balance between freedom in Agile DevOps teams and avoiding an explosion in, in test automation tools in R2D? Oh. Give them that rain. Don't they go out and get their own stuff just like you had back with... They the can, but, but I think the intention is to have it more controlled. Um, so in terms of our testing methodologies, we've, we've changed our development practices where actually we developed a test cases. So the testers, instead of having all the empowerment at the end and choosing what they wanted to use, um, actually had a lot of the contribution up front. Um, oh. And it, that kind of helped with that model. But I yeah. think more importantly, you know, we were actually developing the right way. Um, and we got more standardized on testing approaches and you know, tried to get fully automated. We're not, you know, we're not there yet, but over time, the anticipation will be that we're um, developing 100% of our test cases through automation. Outstanding, and I, yep. I think that's excellent that you took the feedback at the front end so that your constituents didn't, you know, felt like they had a say rather yep. than you. Uh, and, and we've seen that with a lot of things as well. So, for example, knowledge management, which is always typically at the last part of a project, um, is now in the very beginning, and knowledge is developed with every sprint versus waiting for production. Uh, turnover. We've got a work group for you and IT for AD. <laughs> These are some of the issues uh, that we're working with. Um, right. And yep. the, you know, I noted you said you eliminated problem management. There, yep. These are some of the concepts we're working uh, on in some of the IT for IT work groups. Yeah, out of the 26 ITIL processes, through this journey in Oracle, we've actually eliminated eight processes. Okay. Something to speak to him about on the break. I think we'll close with this one. Um, at what level in the organization did the buy-in for IT for IT start, and how did that influence the pace at which you were able to succeed in these beautiful goals that you shared with us? Um, so with my previous company, it actually started in the very front end. So once I had an idea around how I could save the CEO money, um, I said, this is the framework I want to use. It was immediately adopted. Um, within Oracle, I took a different approach. I did not tell anybody I was using IT for IT, um, except those that were working with the process and had to understand how everything interconnected. Um, and it wasn't until um, basically we were selecting um, operating models, so the CEB one that I showed up there, did I say, oh, by the way, you know, we used, um, we used IT for IT as our process framework. And part of the reason there is that you know, ITIL has left such a, a bad taste in people's mouths at Oracle, and they have such an aversion to methodologies. Mm -hmm. So I was able to, to basically build it without them knowing how it was being built, and then we said, oh, by the way, here you go. Um, and now that they understand it, they love it. That's an interesting um, idea that you've shared because so what you're saying is just do good work and show good results and later you can share what your secret sauce was. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you can't go wrong with the, with the process itself. So these two journeys, the last one got you called in to a CEO's mahogany office to start. Uh, when are you getting the call for, from Larry Ellison? <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, you preempted that. <laughs> hopefully, um, after he sees the benefits from all this, yes. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Can we please all give uh, Chris Genowine from Oracle a big hand? Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.